So I want to argue today, I will give you illustrations that go to indicate this point, that if you want to understand the Islamist movement, you need to take free will seriously. So after the massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, people asked the same questions they asked after the attacks in Paris, Brussels, San Bernardino, the same question they ask every time. What explains the jihadists? What explains someone like Omar Mateen taking a gun into a nightclub and killing 49 people, pledging allegiance to Islamic State, which is, to put it mildly, a horrific, theocratic, medieval, destructive regime that wants to kill people all over the world. How could someone pledge allegiance to that and honor them? What explains this? And we've been asking these questions at least since 9-11. And I think one reason we're, we still ask this question is that the basic, the common answers to it are unsatisfying. They don't really explain the issue. They're wrong. They get the jihadists wrong. So I want to illustrate that that they get it wrong. And I want to suggest that the reason they're wrong is that they fail to take free will seriously. So the two views I want to talk about are those of two people I'm sure you've heard about, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Anyone not heard about them? <laughs> I was hoping there'd be one person because I could then say, you're lucky. But <laughs> OK, so Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And there are many more views than the, just these two, but I picked these because I think they're, they're prominent and they represent two very different perspectives. So let me tell you about each of them and then give you some evidence to see why their accounts don't fit the facts, why they fail to really explain the jihadists. Okay, so let's start with Donald Trump's view. After the Orlando shooting, he and Hillary Clinton each gave a speech to present that, yeah, I, I know what I'm talking about, I know what the problem is, and I can stop it. Because ultimately, the reason you care about what explains this phenomenon is so that you can figure out what to do about it. So Donald Trump's view, and I'm reconstituting it because it's not really clear if he has a view, it's not really coherent, but I'm giving it the most charitable interpretation. I think this is the fair way to go. So he's very famous for talking about radical Islam, and those are air quotes, right? I don't think he knows what that means, and I don't think it means anything to him. I think it's really a slogan. It's not really any substantive intellectual or, or ideological, it doesn't have any substance in his mind. I think it's just a slogan, which is shorthand for something that he really cares about, and that really his, speaks to his explanation. And, and you can get that when you read his speech closely, and what he says as what he presents as the most important causal factor it has nothing to do with whatever it is radical Islam is about. It has to do with the background, the religious culture that the killer, Omar Mateen, was born into. And I, I'm paraphrasing. So Donald Trump's bottom line explanation was, it's the only reason this killer was in this country is that we let his parents in. Now, you can take that as a dig against the immigration system, but I don't think that's fundamentally what it is. It is an explanation in terms of the killer's background, his unchosen background, the fact that he was born to parents who are immigrants from far away, who are non-Christian, who are not part of apple pie America and small town America. They're outsiders in a, meaning, in a significant way. They're Muslims. And for Donald Trump, Muslim really just means those people out there, the non-us, the bad people. Now, that's his, I, I think that for him, the causal connection is if you come from, the, if you're born into that society, that kind of religious culture, there's a causal link that leads you to do what Omar Mateen did. They, they have this stuff in their heads. It's from where they were born, how they were raised, what they're surrounded by. Therefore, they do this kind of action. So you can think of the causal connection here, the explanation, if we're piecing it together, it's he was born into this kind of tribe, the, the outsiders, the non-American Muslims. Incidentally, Omar Mateen was born in New York, just like Donald Trump, which is interesting. Um, but his parents were not. That's the problem, his bloodline, what he was born into, stuff outside of his control. So if that's the causal explanation here, and I'm already synthesizing it, does it fit the facts? 
And I don't think it does, and I'll give you two counterpoints to this. Has anyone here heard of uh, the following two people? Ayan Hirsi Ali, by a show of hands. Yeah, quite a few of you have heard. So for those who don't know who she is, she was born in Somalia. She grew up in different parts of the world. She grew up in Saudi Arabia for a while. She was marinated in jihadist ideology, very devout family. Everywhere you look where she grew up, she was bombarded by this religious culture of jihad and, and piety. On Donald Trump's view of this causal explanation, you would expect her to take the same path as Omar Mateen. But if you know anything about her, <clears throat> is that she is the direct opposite. She has become a very brave and vocal critic of Islamists. And the Islamists recognize her as an enemy, and they put a prize tag on her head, <clears throat> and they tried to kill her, and they would like to kill her. She's on a hit list. So it doesn't follow, the, the, the Trump analysis here doesn't really fit the facts. So she has this religious background, she was born into it, and she didn't follow that path. What, what's the difference? What, how does that explain? And I would suggest it's that she chose to reject the ideas all around her as, she, as a child. And she grew up and she adopted different and better ideas. All right, that's one counterpoint. Let's take one other quick one. Who here has heard of John Walker Lind, by a show of hands? Just a few people, not many people. So I'll tell you a bit more about him. John Walker Lind is as American as you can get. He's as insider as you can get. So if, if Donald Trump's definition of being a good American is to be born here and to have parents who are Amer Anglo-Saxon uh, Christians, John Walker Lind had that background. He grew up in Marin County, California. And what we know about him, the reason he's famous and why I mention him, is that he ended up in the ranks of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan fighting against America. Because at age 16, he turned his back on his American background and he converted to Islam. And not only did he do that, he decided that he wants to be a jihadist. So he went to Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and learned and became immersed in these ideas and took up arms against America. So this, again, does not fit the Trump analysis of you're born into a certain religious culture, and that is a strong causal link to being a jihadist. It's exactly the opposite. He was born with the, a very different kind of cultural background. And I think the factor that makes a difference here is that John Walker Lind chose to embrace those ideas in the, in the same way and to the same degree that someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali chose to reject those ideas. So I think when you really piece together what is the view here, it falls apart. It doesn't really fit the facts. So to sum it up, if you, I like tables and summarizing things this way. If there's a causal connection between being a, quote, outsider and a jihadist, Omar Mateen fits that. So it makes a good talking point for Trump's speech. But it doesn't fit the facts. So the two counterpoints, Aaron Hirsi Ali and John Walker Lind, they don't match which is what you would expect on that logic. And I think the Trump view fails because it harps on an unchosen sort of tribal-like religious identity. And it ignores the issue of free will. It doesn't take it seriously. And I, think, I don't think Trump is even thoughtful enough to have this view that free will matters. But that's the implication of the view he holds. So this falls apart because it ignores a fundamental philosophic issue, which is pervasive, free will. So let's turn to Hillary Clinton's view. Now, Hillary Clinton's view, in some ways, is, is seen as more sophisticated. And there's variations of it. But the one that I'm going to um, illustrate for you today is the one she gave in her speech right after the Orlando shooting. Now, her explanation for that event and for the wider phenomenon is in terms of what was in the mind of the, the attacker. Not the ideas in his mind, specifically, but a certain emotional state. And, and the quote that she has in, that really reveals this is, she, as she characterizes his actions, he was a madman filled with vengeance and a, and a desire for and hate and rage. These are her words. And this is, I think, the key and revealing causal point here, which is what was going on in his head is like a virus that poisoned his mind. 
Now, when you get the flu, the flu happens to you, right? A virus happens to you. Typically, you don't choose to become infected by a virus. Notice what this language suggests is that he had some crazy mental stuff in his head. And it led him to take this irrational, destructive action. And the characterization of him as mad is important as well, because so socially, insanity is a marginal phenomenon. Most people are not insane, right? Most people are sane. That, that's, a, I think, unchallengeable fact. So the implication is that there's just a small number of people with this crazy emotional stuff in their head, and that sets them off on this path towards destructive jihadist action. That's the causal account here. But does it fit the facts? And I think the answer is it does not. Now, this is not to deny that there's emotional stuff and, and, and mental content that's going on here, but is it the causally significant factor? I think the answer is no. And you can see that when you look at some data. Okay? So on Hillary's view, you would expect that not many people would hold the same views as the jihadists. Is that true? That is false. And it's also a view, uh, an implication of her view that uh, if you hold the, the same kind of views, you would be led to jihadist uh, action. And that's also false. So in effect, there are a lot of people who hold views in common with the jihadists who are not themselves jihadists. They don't take those actions. So the same me crazy mental stuff in their heads but not the same crazy behavior. Let me illustrate that. So here are some views that the Islamic State holds. Sharia, or Islamic religious law, has to be an absolute. Yes. If you leave Islam, if you're an apostate, you have to be killed. Yes. And if you engage in homosexual behavior, that's immoral. Yes. Now, there's a poll done by the Pew Research Institute, and they surveyed Egyptians, Muslim Egyptians, and they asked them the same questions. Do you think Sharia should be the law of the land? 74% said yes. Do you think apostates deserve death? 88% said yes. 94% of them said their homosexual behavior is immoral. So a lot of people have ideas, and, and Egypt isn't significant because it's comparatively liberal, Western-facing, and it's officially a US ally. So we're not talking about some backward country. I mean, it is backward, but not comparatively to some others. Now, what does this make the people who are answering the surah, are they jihadists? The answer is no. Even though their ideas are very much in common with those of Islamic State and other jihadists. It's non-negotiable if you live under Islamic State that this is how you, what the law of the land looks like. Now, they have, so remember Hillary's causal account here is you have this crazy mental stuff in your head and that leads you to certain actions. Well. A lot of these Egyptians, more than half, a clear majority of the Egyptians polled have very similar crazy stuff in their head. Do they behave in the same way as Omar Mateen? Definitely not. And you can see this because they were asked, do you think that suicide bombing is ever justified to, to defend Islam? And the answer they give, 40% of them say it never is justified. I would like that number to be 100, but still. It's significant that they have the same ideas, very similar ideas as the jihadists, but they do not think you should act on them in the same way. What's the difference here that makes it significant? What is the causal factor? And I think it's that people hold ideas, they can accept ideas and hold them in a certain way, but they don't have the same role in their life as other people. How you apply those ideas, what you take them to mean, how seriously you take them, whether you're willing to act on them, there's a range that, that occurs for every ideology, every system of ideas, that's true. So the Clinton view that if you have this crazy emotional stuff in your head, therefore you're, it leads you to jihad, it doesn't fit the facts. So her view fails, I think, because it ignores that what is fundamental here is that jihadists choose to embrace their ideas, and they choose to take them seriously, and they choose to act on them and to fight and die for them. That is a choice. It is a free will factor. So she fails, I think, her, this kind of account fails because it, it emphasizes 
external forces, like they, their minds are infected by a virus, a, a mental contagion that causes them to take certain actions. That's just not the way it works. And what really matters here is to take the, the, the universal fact that human beings have free will and to see how that plays into this phenomenon. And unless you do that, you can't really explain what the jihadists are about, nor how they came to be so prominent in the Middle East and around the world, how the movement itself, which used to be a sideshow 50 years ago, it was on the ropes, how it became to be, in effect, a rising tide in the region. You can't account for that if you have either the Trump or the Clinton view, or, or other views, because I want to emphasize that there are other explanations I'm not talking about, and you can ask questions about those. But whichever explanation you think has merit, it cannot fully account for things unless it takes free will seriously. We can talk about that as well in, in the session that follows. However you approach this, you can only explain this and then figure out what to do about it if you take free will seriously. So I, the, the emphasis of my talk today is to, to get you to think about the centrality of this philosophic issue. Because in something as, um, most people who think about the Orlando shooting or other jihadist attacks, they see them as political maybe or psychological phenomena or just crazy crime phenomena. But ultimately to understand it, you need a philosophic framework and you need to see how philosophic ideas play out, and, and the crucial issue there is that people choose their ideas, good ideas or bad ideas, ideas that are productive and ideas that are destructive. When you get that point, when you have that framework, which I think is part of what Ayn Rand offers, and when you understand that people have a choice about the ideas they hold, then you can actually make sense of the world and figure out how to solve serious problems like this one. And I'll encourage you to pick up a copy of my book. I think there are some uh, outside, and if you haven't got a copy, let me know. I'll be happy to arrange one for you. Thank you.